Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the first Sombrero presentation at a conference since the spin out in October of 2020. Uh, many of you are aware, many of you are shareholders who are watching this, and many of you have heard a little about it. But this was at one time prior to the SpinCo, it was the pearl of Orange market cap. It was the company, the asset that got everyone's attention. It carried a 250 to $300 million market cap itself a few times with Oren as a focal point. It is a rare opportunity that shouldn't be available to a junior. You don't see this as an exploration investor ever. It's got the scale opportunity. It's got the new discovery opportunity, and it's got the address to be one of the world's largest copper gold discoveries that we've seen in the past few decades and for the decades to come. My name is Ivan Bebek. I'm the president and CEO of this company, and I'm also the co-founder, formerly the executive chairman of Oren Resources, which led the spinning out of Sombrero Tier 1 Silver and the creation of Fury Gold Mines. Um, many of you, before I get started, many of you ask, which is my favorite company? I like them all for the exact reason why I liked Oren that had all these opportunities. And I'm more than impressed with each company's development going forward. They all have these large scale potential monster type of discovery potentials. I will be making some forward looking statements. I promise they will be optimistic because I'm in a good mood. I'm very excited about what's coming, but more importantly, I'm gonna be optimistic towards some timelines of when we might trade for the first time in a very long time, which is very exciting for all of us. I'm not gonna belabor ourselves as a management team. This is the Oren management team that you were experiencing as an Oren investor. Um, notably, myself and Sean Wallace are the two co-founders of Oren and the group and with us, are Michael Henriksen and Dave Smithson. These two gentlemen come from Newmont. They were global experts, uh, Michael, global structural geologist, Dave, global mapper for Newmont. And they brought a lot of their world-class experts that worked within Newmont to come work with us. The merging of them and our skills and background has allowed us to go out and take on these major exploration swings that we're talking about in all of our companies. But before I go further, you know, for a lot of you generalists that are hearing about this for the first time, it's very difficult to learn an industry and to learn a group of why you should invest. A reputation and track record is everything, and whether you know the space or not. Um, Sean and I started out by found, founding Keegan Resources. We found 5 million ounces of gold. And being very share price minded as shareholders, we delivered a tremendous success through that discovery to $9 per share. Our model is generally to find it and sell it. We are a serial exploration group, and that's the, the exciting investment curve. I think that's about 19 times your money in Keegan that we pursue at a very minimal for our companies. Um, we did not sell Keegan, it became Galliano Gold. It's a producer today, and that's the consequence, but we've never left a company behind in our careers. We have stuck with whatever company we started until they became a success, regardless of how much time or energy it took for us to make those happen. Caden Resources was a product of us learning more, meeting some incredible geologists from Newmont that helped us deliver a great success in the middle of the bear market. In 2014, we sold it to Agnico Eagle. Um, if you held your shares of Agnico, which is what we were purchased by, you would have received a double about 14 months after that share price traded at 350 per share on the deal, which was a tremendous return because the mining market was in the pit of the market. What's important about that transaction is we took all the wealth we've generated and we created Oren Resources and we raised over $100 million trying to find the world's largest mines and discoveries. And that's where we came up with the assets in Fury Gold Mines, in Tier 1 Silver, as well as the ones in Sombrero, which is what we're going to talk about today. Sombrero is, is big. When you think about Sombrero, you have to think about really big. It does have a head start over the other two because there are some historical drill holes in the actual top of my screen where it says record of success. That is actually the core from one of the drill holes. Our technical team is led by Michael and Dave. Um, Dave is involved on Tier 1 Silver. He's living in Peru and him with uh, Christian Rios is our VP of operations. They're both in kind uh, running the operations day to day down in Peru and it's being overseen by Michael Henriksen, our chief geologist. On our board and the head of our technical team is Antonio Rivas. He was the uh, former chief geologist of Newmont and VP of Geological Sciences for BHP, the largest, two largest mining companies in the world, one being gold and one being uh, base metal. 
this is a, a very critical for the guidance of you know how we're going to drive forward on these discoveries and what they mean going forward. We're going to talk about copper here. Uh, the demand is outpacing supply. Uh, any of you who are building a new house, buying a new computer, buying an electric car, we are running out of copper as a planet. The copper supply is 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 largely in in a, in a very bad state, and a lot of people project, as you're seeing here, demand to double by 2050. You know, in terms of that kind of outlook on copper, it gives us a lot of comfort to go after world-class copper discoveries as we are doing here. It gives us a, an eternal bull market in front of us that's going to be consequential for premiums and how we trade. But we're also going to potentially end up providing some kind of supply help if we find something in the magnitude of a Las Bombas as we're looking to do here with Sombrero. That being said, the, the counter argument to copper is there's several low grade mines that exist in the world. And these several low grade mines can potentially come online if the copper price continues to go up. These mines cost a lot of money and it takes a lot of time to get these mines online. Uh, example, if Sombrero is a discovery of consequence, it will take between 10 and 20 years for that mine to pour its first or create its first, produce its first tonnage of copper. That being said, the investment curve would be the most robust for Sombrero during the discovery, discovery phase, which is what we offer going forward. So here's where we are. We're in Southern Peru, we're in Ayacucho. And just a quick comment on Peru before I get into the project. It's just recently gone through an election. Uh, Castillo, the, the, the new president is, is one. He was the hardcore leftist of the two. The good news about the election is there's an extreme left and extreme right, and the election was within 0.2 basis points. It was extremely close, which means that nothing can really change of consequence. Congress is divided, but majority right. Uh, the president is majority left or is, is extreme left. And you know, from that perspective, since I've been working in Peru, the president has changed five different times. And so the, the actual Peru landscape is one that changes if presidents aren't working out and it relies heavily on mining, which impacts approximately 40% of its GDP. And post COVID, uh, I'm not sure if everyone realizes this, but Peru is one of the hardest hit countries in the world. So post COVID, you know, there's a very big economic gap that needs to be filled. And what we're anticipating is more leniency towards mining and permitting and getting access. We think that things will improve versus go the other way. So we're really excited to be past the election. We're drilling in Peru with one of our projects. We're permitting, we're acquiring other assets. We do not have any real concern on Peru. The land package is quite large, 130,000 hectares. It's extremely under uh, explored and it sits next to some of the largest mines in the world, which you'll see on this slide here. So why does this exist? Well, first of all, a series of major mines on the right-hand side of the slide here, Las Bombas in particular, which is the 10th largest copper mine in the world, uh, Tintaya, which is a, was an incredibly rich mine, Las Chancas, which is a substantial mine. These are some of the larger mines in Peru and larger mines globally. And if you look at the pink color, those are intrusions that have brought up the copper, copper and gold that has occurred in these mines. The green color that you see on this slide, this is the color that's used for or described as for volcanics. A volcano erupted and a lot of the rocks were covered. What happened here in terms of Sombrero was a lot of the rocks were covered and there was a couple erosional windows that were exposed. And the government came through here before us, so did several major mining companies. And they overlooked this area and assumed that the rocks were Miocene, which would be the volcanic cover, not Eocene, which is the 40 million a year age rocks that we've aged dated, which is the same as all the mines next door. So this area was missed by several major mining companies we have been there and we took initiative early. We went out and we screened by sampling streams that, that would imply drainages off of some of the ridges you see here in the topography. We sampled for gold and copper to establish a, hot, a heat map of where a lot of copper and a lot of gold exist. Most of the work we've done to date is pointed out by the blue star right where my cursor is, area of work dated. And if you look at the actual whole entire land position, and if you look at the image on the left, you're seeing copper. And if you look at the image on the right, you're seeing gold. Macha Mackay has the most robust copper numbers to date. Although we think we've got the analog to Las Bombas up here in Sombrero, Maine and the NEOC targets, which I'll talk about today. 
And, the, and in terms of gold, there's a nice gold overlay on the Machi Makai area as well. But both of these, these maps or these claims show that they're much stronger than where we're working. And my point there that I'm trying to make is we still don't know where the best target is in the land position. The community access agreements we're waiting for will give us access to Machi Makai. It will start getting trenched right away. It will go on the pipeline of drilling alongside Neoc and Sombrero, Maine, which are going to be first. If we're going to talk about a large mine, we're going to look to see how accessible is this, you know, what kind of infrastructure, and there's going to be a lot of ore to be produced or a lot of tonnage to be moved here. And what we have is, is a blessing. We have paved roads right into the project. We have high tensile power lines. The government built this high tensile power line right through our property since we've been here, which is incredible. We joke that we could plug in an extension cord for power, which generally is the biggest challenge. There is access to water as well. We're about 3,900 meters elevation, so we're not too high in the Andes where it would be too cumbersome, and several mines are operating at this level and above in Peru. So a massive check mark there on infrastructure and potential profitability. The analogous geology, now this is important. This is more of a scientific slide, and I'll keep it as simple as I can for the benefit of everyone here. The mines such as Las Bombas, Tintaya, all those big mines next door, they occur in the Ferrobamba. That's the blue limestone unit that you see above there. What you're seeing here in pink is an intrusion coming up and you're seeing the exact same contact of rocks there as we're seeing within our targets. This is the Ferrobamba limestone here. There is a difference though. We have a second limestone unit called the Gramadal which occupies the closest mine to our project called Anticapai Las Chancas. So we have another unit, host unit of limestone that could actually deliver additional discoveries. So we would argue from a very speculative early stage, this could deliver a lot more than what you've seen on the belt next door because it has two very important horizons, two very important reactionary limestone units that could potentially interact and give us that copper gold deposit we're looking for. And lastly, when you sample the surface, we have an 18 by six kilometer footprint of geochemical signature, which implies that this area has a robust formation of metals underneath all of this green volcanic cover. It's the pathfinder we were looking for, and it gives us a chance to kind of arm wave ourselves towards scale, which is substantial. The magnetic anomaly now, when you're looking for these large copper gold systems, copper in particular, you wanna see a big magnetic signature. Um, you see a substantial one here uh, with the most richest or the strongest signal coming off of NEOC. It also, NEOC also has five gram gold and 9% copper. But the most important piece of data on this slide, and I'm gonna talk about it in a few slides, is a historical drill hole drilled by Acero Serequipa, a multinational mining company. This company was looking for, it's a steel company, it was looking for steel for iron ore. And they drilled a hole that had 116 meters of 0.58% copper, another one with 90 meters of 0.5% copper gold equivalent. Those are spectacular holes for the system. They are in line with everything we think could be there. And they have given us a signature through both magnetics, and you'll see in a moment in our geophysics and our chargeability that imply that we have substantial scale, which I'll show you in just a moment. And the last part that goes with this property is the 232 meters of 0.5.5% copper equivalent um, in a trench uh, above these drill holes. So we've sampled 100 to 200 meters in various areas around the claims here, only in the Sombrero Main, we will be sampling and trenching NEOC next. And we've seen the grade potential economic or grade right on surface. We see it in a window on the drill hole in the edge of the system, which gives us a lot of confidence that this will continue. So when you actually look at the magnetics here on the right, and you look at the chargeability on the left, you want these two to overlap, and this will define your target areas where you could have copper gold mineralization. If you look on the image on the right or left, you see a 10 kilometer shape, it's a very strong signal that goes around, and that makes up the first two areas we're gonna drill. This is where we've been waiting for access to drill in the near term. Historically, the drill hole I mentioned is right here where the 116 meters of 0.58 occurs. It gave us a signature for all of this target area as well as here that we can actually use as a fingerprint 
to see where else there might be that potential grade of copper and gold. Um, there's a large depth proponent to this. Some parts of the targeting goes down to seven, 800 meters. Some of it's 400 meters thick, and there's areas that could go north of a kilometer. So there's a big variance in depth, but there most certainly is one of the largest footprints of copper and gold on the surface that we have seen. Just going to look at Sombrero Main, which is the lower area below Neoc here. It's where we've permitted our first drill holes or, or we've gotten the environmental versus the social permit for our first drill holes. This is a, an intrusion, our property up here in the upper left corner, surrounded by exoscarn in red and endoscarn in yellow. And this is forming what would look like a donut. And if you look at the mine on the belt next door, we're just showing you that it's exactly what they have. Copper scarn around an intrusive we're not trying to find something different in terms of a geological model. We're just trying to find something that is the same and the same caliber and scale, which you're seeing here. And lo and behold, it ended up being a huge hole in the ground for that. That's the Tintaya mine that was once operated by BHP, now operated by Glencore, but was an extremely profitable mine. This is a close up of that donut look for us. And these are actually our planned drill holes that you see in the black circles with the, with the lines. Um, you do see a big porphyry target coming into it here that ta taps into those historical drill holes. We see that with the core at Furaso and the signatures technically. So the first area that we've actually achieved what's called the DIA to give us the environmental permit access to drill here um, is, is already ready to go and no further work needs to be done. And this is the drill plan that would occur. Specifically, you look at things like surface 109 meters of 0.7% copper. That would be in the exoscarn. And then you see stuff such as 105 meters of 0.3 closer on the endoscarn. You're going to have a variance of grade. But if you take the 4,000 samples that we've collected in this area to date, we're averaging 0.6% copper gold with about 0.5 of that or 0.48 of that being copper and the rest of that being gold which is identical to the same grade as Las Bombas, which is 1.5 billion tons of 0.6%. So core, there is a few drill holes here. And in comparison to other things I'm involved in, this one has the head start that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, the top core you're seeing is, is the most important rock that we've seen from the project. This is drilled in the sulfide and we're seeing exoscar mineralization with calcopyrite. Um, the signal that I showed you earlier with the magnetics and the chargeability could have been mistaken for water or clay. And where it came to for us was we wanted to see whether it was water or clay or potentially calcopyrite, which is copper pyrite. And obviously at 62 meters above a percent copper and half a gram gold. So that was the biggest check mark that we got on this asset to give us the confidence that that fingerprinting signature for 10 kilometers was absolutely real. The core and the oxide you don't have to be a trained geologist, anybody who's had a copper pot at home or seen copper on a roof, you can see the green oxidation, oxidization here in the core. And again, this is running half percent copper and 0.1 grams per ton gold, or you know, at 33 meters plus a percent copper and 0 0.03 grams gold. This is as close as you're gonna get to a heads up that this could be, or a hint that this could be that major discovery. This is an important slide. It's a lot more important than everybody realizes because I believe the first community access will be on this target. And then the second one will follow sequentially in Wonka Sanko's the second community. Um, this is the most robust surface expression we've seen in terms of grade. We have not trenched this yet. We will be trenching where you see the multi-gram and multi-percent copper. That will be the first news flow to come out of our company once we begin trading as we wait for drill permits that should follow, you know, in the six in the months afterwards, not years, but months afterwards, we think it'll be anywhere from three to four or six months to get drill permits on both of the areas finalized. So something to look very forward to, it will make the system a lot bigger by surface work. We will have Sombrero Main, which I showed you where drill holes are planned. And then we will have NEARC online and where we're really curious do the trenches here average 1% copper, 2% copper, or 0.6, 0.7, like the other areas of Sombrero, Maine? It looks like a bit of a jewelry box in terms of grade endowment. And if you remember the slides previously, is some of our strongest magnetic and chargeability signatures on the project. This is the third place we will drill. This is in the San Jose de Huacaya community, and it would follow the suit of the other two access points. It's about seven kilometers from the two first areas we will drill and it gives us the first look at the third dimension of what could exist 
subsurface. In terms of that, there's a massive scar in body. It goes down 400 meters and incredible grades on surface. This is giving us a free cross section of what might be underneath that 10 kilometer footprint that could give us that robust, substantial deposit that occurs going down the side of the hill, 0.9 to 3% copper, 1 to or 0.3 to gram gold on top of it, 0.5 to 4% copper and 0.3 to 5 grams gold. I think there's going to be some substantial high grade opportunities to the system. I think we're going to have scale in terms of endowment, and it's going to be a, a tremendously profitable mining scenario once it comes to. I mentioned earlier that all of the work I'm talking about, NEOC, Sombrero, Maine is right here. This is the fingerprint of copper that we sampled at Macha Makai, which is the highest grade in the entire land position. This will come and we'll have access to trench here as well when we resume trading and we'll get a chance to get targets here in the pipeline. So likely we're drilling Neoc and Sombrero Main first and then Macha Makai would be, would be in the background the same time as we likely get to Good Lucky the Cliff that I've just shown you. Sombrero's next steps. Now it gets interesting for all of you who are shareholders who are waiting for us to come public. Um, the next steps are, are, are critical. Um, we need community access before we can relist and we are close. We took a long-term approach. You've heard me say this a few times recently to get the really substantial relationships that we want, not just to get access to drill so we can list, but we think we have something here that could go into the scale of Las Bombas and for the monetization and the future 50 or 60 years that this will Im impact communities we want to make sure there are very, very strong, long-term, cooperative, sustainable, very strong community relations. And we have spent the time, we spent the money to create those environments so that once we get started, we will be in a, in a form with the communities that will benefit not just us, but if eventually we're bought by a major mining company, it will benefit them tremendously going forward. We've done more than the average company does in Peru to get here. But what I want to just point out on this slide is we had a full access at Sombrero, Maine, and on renewal of the access to answer a lot of questions, why don't you have it now? The presidents of the community changed. The community elected a different president, so we did not receive our renewal from the community. It's on pause. We are waiting for the existing president to receive transfer of power from the past president. Once that happens, and we expect that to happen in the next 30 or 40 days, then we look forward to getting our meeting to renew our previous access agreement. I'll explain a second proponent to that in just a moment. Lucana Marca, which has NEOC, and it will impact the Good Lucky community as well. This community has come a long way with us from when we were first there, and we've developed some significant agriculture programs that are on, on standby, provided we get the access. This will benefit both them tremendously as well as our, ourselves getting us access, but this is where we anticipate to get access first uh, in the next 30 to 40 days. There's a meeting coming up in July and another meeting in August. I'm not going to be specific on dates, but we would hope to have access here by the end of August so that we could apply for relisting and list some time in September. Um, we've done a great job with the TSX exchange. It's the exchange we prefer to list on. There's no guarantee we will list there first, but it's one that we've targeted. Should we get access and raise some capital, we would meet all the requirements to list there. If things drag on longer, there's another plan so that we, with the communities, so that we could get listed in relatively short order. Why am I so confident that access is around the corner? Why am I talking to everybody now for the first time and bringing Sombrero to life? It has to do with what we've done and what we're going to do. Um, so far, we've invested what seems like a modest amount of $100,000 but we've brought in almost $500,000 from the government through these agridius agricultural programs that are being put on. So far, we've funded with the government Australian lamb breeding programs, a weaving program. We've also done fish farms. We've done quite a few things, and this was primarily in Wonk Sankos. And what we're working towards now is a multi-million dollar impact about a million and a half at Wonka Sanko's continuation of this program with new things that we're gonna bring in there on the agricultural basis and about a $2.4 million program for Lucana Marca. These are substantial efforts. They take a considerable amount of time for us to go to get the government grants. We sponsor them. We are heavily involved in creating these programs. They cannot happen without us because we are the sponsors that validate that these programs are gonna be done properly and efficiently. And we've demonstrated 
through the first community programs that we've already done this, the jobs that we're talking about that go with these agric agricultural programs will impact nearly half the residents of each community. So extremely positive long-term effects, and that's what's gonna be you know, in front of us going forward. So we think that our presence there, these large programs, they're, on, on, they're about to be put in motion and that would happen in conjunction with our access agreements going forward. And I think that's a reason for all of us to be optimistic. Making the discovery is one thing, but having this kind of impact, it's more year two or year three that you'd get to this level, but getting to there now will secure a community relationship from the beginning that's gonna be extremely sustainable, long-term positive impact. And, and we feel that the community absolutely recognizes our presence there is some politics between the communities, as I mentioned, a transfer of presidents, a transfer of power that do not involve us. So we have to wait until those communities are sorted. The complexities of what we're doing is it's not worth updating everybody on a day by day, monthly basis, because it would just be too cumbersome and, and it's confusing. However, the general direction is very positive. And I like to think we're in the last, you know, 10% or 5% of, of getting there from the effort that we're 90, 95% through, and for the very good reason, the benefit of the project going forward. Our biggest strength is our shareholders, um, very large shareholder, um, as management, I'm the largest shareholder of the company, putting a lot of capital into Orin, and a lot of friends and family own that. Um, the reason why we're successful is because of existing shareholders. We are very shareholder minded, and if you own shares of Orin, you received one share of tier one, you got one full share of Sombrero, you got 0.676 shares of Fury Gold Mines. That split still has yet to fully monetize the outcome, but that's a very shareholder-minded event. Um, it took on a level of work in terms of finding new people, in terms of branding new assets. It really pushed my workday from about 12 to 14 hours to about 18 hours a day. However, it's in the best interest of the shareholders and it can monetize all of us substantially going forward. This is a big swing sombrero and we're looking for incredibly huge assets as we are with the other companies and it's required a lot of patience and time is, is is certainly an ingredient and a cost that you have to pay for these kind of opportunities the good news is we're at the end of that timeline of waiting and we're almost at the point of where we're going to find out where things are going to happen next now as I talk about, oh, sorry, I'll mention one more thing. Financing, we have $5 million in the treasury. That's obviously not enough to drill and it will take us into Q1 of next year by virtue of burn rate. Um, we will need to raise money and we have a few options here, which is a great thing to say when you're looking to raise capital. We could do a funding much like tier one did prior to listing. Um, no shortage of demand for people to invest into here. If you have an interest to participate and you're an existing shareholder or you want to become a shareholder, my email is ivan at sombreroresources.com. It would be best for you to be directly contacting myself. The other opportunity is that we've gotten substantial attention from about five different major mining companies around the world. And Newmont Gold Corp is an existing shareholder. We are open to investments by strategic investors that might end up being and purchasers of this company. Um, we've negotiated and had discussions with quite a few. If we're able to achieve a strategic investment that is done at a, a great valuation that could benefit shareholders with that validation of the corporate investor, as well as a path forward to potentially a monetizing relationship and would give the company working capital not to need to raise any more capital, that would be a preferred route, provided the terms and the prices were something we were comfortable with. So if that does not prevail, we will look to do a funding with shareholders or investors prior to going to market. And uh, we won't know the answer to that question probably up until the end of August. That's where we'll start to get some clarity. So in summary, worth the wait, um, knowing how prospective this project is, knowing how rare this is to find as an exploration investor, seeing it in a junior versus a major mining company it is truly that rare and that sensational of an opportunity the copper market has gone from two dollars and change per share to over four dollars per share since we've been on this journey which is the one copper lining i say to to the actual weight the commodity price is going up demand is going up so we have a lot better chance to perform at a much larger premium than we would have previously the analogous features and the historical drill hole 
reduce the risk of expiration considerably and give us a world-class shot at something substantial. And lastly, we are near the finish line. There is no guarantee though that my optimism or our optimism is gonna transpire into agreements and trading in September, or October of this year. So being very ambitious, being very driven and being the CEO of an unlisted company, you know, with an, 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 a huge ambition to be listed and to be trading and to go on this adventure publicly and provide liquidity for those that wanna join or those that need liquidity, we have identified another significant asset that would rival Sombrero in potential interest extremely low cost up front, but same reward at the end. We are working towards possibly acquiring this only for the reason that if Sombrero takes on more delays that we can't control, we will have something as exciting as Sombrero to look forward to in the background. And second point to go after this asset, why would we do it? One of our directors commented, if Sombrero is so good, Ivan, why would you get a second asset? Greed comes into that. We've been hunting for five years with Oren for these big assets, and we found something that meets the Sombrero threshold of excitement. And if we could sell the company twice or for a lot more, assuming successful, we'd like to offer that opportunity to shareholders. So in summary, look forward to resolution with the communities, something consequential by the end of August. You will start to hear podcasts. I will be more informative, more communicative, as there's now a lot of things happening to talk about. Look forward to a potential acquisition that may arise, that may give us that secondary asset that if in case Sombrero takes longer, we get back to market and we have something of same caliber to go after and drill and deliver for shareholders. And thirdly, I'd say that you wanna have insurance, but if you can find the right assets and have these major assets and do it in a capital efficient manner, and you can deliver it twice or multiple times to shareholders. That's really the, the end goal of what we're trying to achieve here. Thank you all very much for your patience. Thank you all very much for your support. And I promise you that we are getting very close to coming back listing. And we are assuming on the side of, erring on the side of optimism that we're gonna get there with Sombrero first. And we'll have a secondary asset in the background of similar caliber that can potentially deliver for shareholders. With that being said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to go back to any questions that anybody has about my presentation. I'm gonna take a look into the questions here. Um, first question by Alex, why did you choose to be the CEO of Sombrero over tier one? Imagine the reason you did not choose Fury is because the development aspect of Fury, whereas Sombrero and Tier 1 are pure exploration companies. Thank you. Uh, great question. And I've talked about this a little bit. And without the cliche of saying choosing your favorite child is, is difficult, where I'm at here is I'm at a point of I really wish I was the CEO of all three. And I mean that sincerely. I know there's development around Fury, but there's much more exploration to be done before development will actually start and be talked about with any serious way. There's no engineers on that board and there's a lot more gold to be found at Eau Claire and there's a lot of discoveries to be made at Committee Bay. So to finish that point there, I will just say that if I could be CEO of Fury tomorrow, if Michael Timmons was not available, if we did not have that path going forward, I would have most certainly enjoyed that as my front and center. Tier one silver, I've dreamed about silver. I mean, very large shareholder as everyone knows, um, but importantly, again, um, I wanted to do it just the same, but I had to choose one of the three. And where I made the decision was, I'm obviously well integrated into Sombrero, the history, the path, the communities, the depth of the strategy that's gotten us to this point. It would have been most disruptive for me to step away from Sombrero to be the CEO of one of the other companies and bring a new CEO and bring them up to speed. Um, there is an appeal. I do have a special place for Sombrero in terms of what it means and as they do for all projects, but I like them all equally. They're all potential monsters that could deliver that, that return that I've talked about from time to time. So it's, it's, it comes down to logic and less, less interruptive for me to do that. Should Fury make the discovery, should Tier 1 make the discovery as the chairman of those companies or co-chair of Fury, uh, Tier 1, I will be there in full spirit alongside Peter or alongside Mike to champion that forward ahead, even though I'll be obviously working on, on Sombrero as well. 
Harvey Choi, thank you for your question. If raising capital, how much is required to fund the program? Uh, Harvey, uh, this question is, is a great question. We would probably raise in the range of 10 to $15 million, depending on prices of what we would be looking to raise going forward. Uh, and that would cover the first drill programs at Sombrero. We would be very price sensitive, careful of where that valuation came out because we would want to be very selective on who buys us and make sure that we could drill those first holes, which we think have a lot of probability to raise the price of the share price, to re-rate the company's valuation, validate the discovery, and then go take on a much larger expenditure. We think that 50 drill holes would more than define a world-class opportunity and could get us into that place of competitiveness from the multiple mining companies that have expressed interest to be investors or potentially purchase some barrel if it's real. We think that would be enough to do it. 50 drill holes could cost us in the range of anywhere from 10 to $20 million US. So, you know, we wouldn't finance all of that at once unless we got something at a very good valuation from a major mining company. Um, Jonathan Kwan, I uh, may miss this. Have we estimated a timeline for being listed publicly? I'm going to do everything I can. We are going to do everything we can to be listed at the latest in October. Um, if we can shorten that timeline, we will. Right now, the biggest contingent factor is the access to the communities, which we're hoping to resolve in one of the communities in August. Should that take place, it shouldn't take long, four to five weeks for us to get listed. And we have been preparing to be listed for some time. And I'd argue that we could have been listed in Q1 easily ahead of tier one even had we had access. But unfortunately, um, we don't have access yet. There's a second asset we will acquire should Sombrero drag on that could get us listed sooner and give us an equal opportunity to go and explore at the same time. Harvey, uh, his question in discussions with majors, how serious are the discussions? Would an agreement be expected this year or next year? Um, without speaking out of turn, Harvey, um, We've had discussions for three years with Sombrero, with a handful of majors, and all I will say is those discussions are, are quite mature and the ambition towards working together is quite high. So it's all relative, you know, but it, those discussions are, are most certainly real. Um, if we can't come to terms with a strategic investor with a major mining company on a deal that worked for both sides, we will come to market and do the raise. And the decision point there is probably end of August at the latest, the first week or two of September. So stand by for that. Any other questions that anybody has? And, and I sincerely apologize for my little guy interrupting me uh, during, I don't think he realized I was live on a Zoom call and uh, trying to balance family and work. But uh, I, I thank you all for listening today. My email is ivan at sombreroresources.com. I want to offer direct contact to me if you want to have a call or an email for anybody who's frustrated waiting, excited and waiting, or would like to know more. Thank you all very much for being patient investors and all of you who have not owned us yet. Uh, we're looking forward to an extremely exciting launch once we get towards listing. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope you have a great day. Thank you.